Filters, analog filters. That's the topic for today. So why do we need filters? <laughs> well, we know this. The world is analog, it's ruled by quantum mechanics. When you go a little bit bigger into transistors, it's ruled by Maxwell equations. There are people in the world that are very smart and have come up with a great idea many, many years ago to simplify the analog world and to make it digital. Represent everything that we know as ones and zeros in the computer. <laughs> images, text, whatever, ones and zeros. And this is a fa quite fantastic abstraction because you take away the analog uncertainties or technologies and all the sort of complexities and you just say there are only ones and zeros. The great thing about that, it has made it possible for digital designers to reuse stuff. We can write Verilog code and you can port it relatively easily from one technology to another technology. However, in the analog world, it's not that easy. Basically, when you make analog circuits, well, I can try and teach you, but in the end, you will have to fight the fight yourself. You have to figure out how the real world works and spend hours upon hours and upon hours on tuning your circuit and getting it right. So sort of fundamentally, should we then do most of the processing in the digital realm? I think yes. But in order to do that, we have to somehow get from the analog to the digital. So that's of course, analog to digital converters. So quite often you'll find that any system, it could be a radio for example, consists of a some sort of sensor, maybe that's the antenna, and it might contain an analog front end or AFE, where we have an amplification, we maybe have frequency list frequency selectivity, domain transfers, so transferring from current to voltage and so on. And at some point, we convert the signal into digital. But we could imagine that we just do that directly from the antenna. We take the antenna and we slap an ADC on it. <laughs> so why do we need this analog front end? Why do we need to know about filters at all? Well, let me try and explain. The challenge with signals in the real world is that they can be incredibly weak. Take a normal radio, for example, uh, that sits on this uh, whip. The sensitivity levels on that radio is going to be on the order of minus 90 dBm. And zero dBm here is zero millivolts. Millivolt we can convert that to a voltage in a 50 ohm resistor. And if we do that, the wanted signal is maybe around seven microvolts. But I'm not the only one that has a Bluetooth stuff in my vicinity. It might be a telephone, it might be other things that have much higher output power. So there's quite possible that there's a blocker or an un unwanted signal that is a lot higher than my wanted, maybe minus 30 dBm or translated into 50 ohm about seven millivolts. But if I want to convert the wanted signal into digital, well, that's the part I want to look at. And if I use an ADC, let's say that I need um, eight bits for my wanted signal. So wanted divided by 255, we're talking 28 nano. So if I wanted to make a single ADC that could capture both the blockers and my wanted signal, I need on the order of 18 bits. So that's possible. It's possible to make ADCs with that resolution. But there's a caveat. If I wanted to capture the Bluetooth signals directly, 
those are transmitted at 2.4 gigahertz, which means I'd need to sample around 5 gigahertz, twice the sampling, uh, twice the uh, bandwidth. Now there's a nice little figure of merit, Walden's figure of merit, that's the top part here, that tells us something about how good an analog to digital converter is. So you take the power, you divide it by 2 to the power of effective number of bits, you multiply by the sampling frequency. And it turns out that the best figure of merit in the world is around 1 femtojoule per step. So we can just plug that into the equation and get that in order for us to make an AEC that is 18-bit, if it's possible, well, that ADC would consume 1.31 watts. And if we have a look inside the WHOOP, uh, you can actually do that if you didn't know. You you can do um, just a Google search for uh, whatever you want to look inside. In this case, WHOOP teardown will get you to a page that looks like this. And inside I can find the battery. And I can see it's a 205 milliamp hour 3.8 volts battery. Probably a lithium ion something something. Which means that if my radio actually consumed 1.31 watts, it only my little whoop would only last for an hour. However, I know my wristband lasts for a bit, about a week, even when it's continuously transmitting data to my phone. Now, I know a little bit about what is actually inside the WHOOP. Uh, the reason for that is, let me go there first. I work in a company called Nordic, and Nordic has put on its website that actually this WHOOP band that has a Nordic chip inside. And we can actually see it here. E cool, that's the Bluetooth radio. Anyway, I know it's not consuming 1.31 watts, <laughs> for sure. So how is it doing that? Well, the trick is filters. This is not exactly what's inside the radio. I can't tell you that. <laughs> but I can tell you how similar radios were made in papers. So the way we convert the um, incoming wanted signal much more efficiently than in just put, putting the ADC directly on the antenna, is to first amplify it a little bit with a low noise amplifier, and then we change the frequency. So we actually go from our 2.4 gigahertz using complex mixtures down to a lower frequency. And sometimes people will use what's called polyphase filters, because here we try to filter away everything we don't need. Because the Bluetooth channel, the Bluetooth sort of communication, is only one megahertz wide. So we only need a bandwidth of about one to two megahertz, depending on how we do this. And we only want to convert that part, because the less we convert to digital, the more effective we can make the radio. So filters are important. They're necessary in order to make low power electronics. You want to you massage your sensor data as much as possible before you try to convert it into digital. So an important point is there's no point in making the filter, a sort of a general purpose filter, unless you know what the application is. Or actually, there's no point in making a general purpose filter, making a circuit that you can sort of insert anywhere. Um, that does make sense. It's like a general purpose op amp. Doesn't make sense. An op amp or an OTA must be made for a specific purpose. It can be the same topology, but yeah. So, how do we make them? First of all, let's refresh some concept. Any filter, continuous time filter, can be synthesized from a combination of a first and a second order uh, filter stages. So you can have sort of a first order, first order, first order, third order, not, not third order, second order, and that becomes a fourth order or whatever. So 
combination of first and second order filters can be combined into any filter type. Quite often in the book, in um, the Advanced Integrated Circuits book, no, Analog Integrated Circuit Design, signal flow graphs are used. And that's what's shown on the left side here. We'll have a box that is an integrator. And then there's these arrows with a coefficient on the side. That means the multiplication. And well, the way you calculate these type of um, what the output voltage is, is that you take, you sum all the, for example, VO times minus VO, uh, omega O plus VI times KO plus VI times K1 times S. And that goes through the one over S and that becomes our VO. And then you do a bunch of algebra and make sure you got the sign correctly. And then you can compute the transfer function. I don't think there's a good way of doing this other than sitting down and doing it by hand. So you can try Maple, you can try SymPy. I've tried, I've not really gotten it to work well. Basically, at some point in time, you probably just have to sit down and work out the transfer function. Once you have the transfer function though, you don't need to do it again, or you can just look it up. But the point is that there are structures that make up sort of a general purpose first order and in what you're looking at now is a general purpose second order filter. These are sometimes referred to as biquads or biquadratic. And that just means there's two qu quadratic equations and using this first and second order filter, you can make pretty much any filter. Whether, yeah. When you actually want to synthesize the filter, getting from sort of a certain filter response into the H of S. Maybe that's easy as done in MATLAB with a filter synthesis toolbox or something like that, where you can put in uh, the uh, pass band ripple and the stop band ripple, and that gets you to a S domain equation. Once you have the S domain equation, you try to filter it out into first order and second order stages, and then you figure out what the coefficients should be. But at some point, you probably need to sit down and work through these transfer functions. The interesting part is, once we have a certain transfer function, an H of S, how do we actually implement it? There are a couple of different ways, but in general, one is called uh, GMC or transconductance C, the other one's called active RC. Let's look at the GMC first. The principle here is that we use a transconductor in order to get a current into a capacitor. And if we work out the equation for a current into a capacitor, the output voltage is basically the current divided by the um, S, I guess that's the Laplace <laughs> S, times the capacitance. So in this case, the impedance, the complex impedance of a capacitor is one over S C, right? We can redefine it in terms of the unit gain or the, uh, yeah, this will be the unit gain frequency. And the unit gain frequency is given by GM divided by C. So if you can control the transconductance and we can control the C, then we can get sort of a known unit gain frequency of this integrator. And this is an integrator. The GM we're talking about here is actually the large signal GM. It's not sort of this usual transconductance that we see in the small signal model for the transistors. It is possible to make differential circuit also. So you have here a differential GM and differential circuits are cool. You end up with basically the same transfer function, the same H of S, because in this case, the VO is actually defined as the voltage on the plus side minus the voltage on the minus side, and you end up with the same equation. But the cool thing about differential circuits is that it's fantastically easy to generate a negative gain. All I need to do, if you observe the plus plus minus minus here, is that, is that 
just need to swap the differential output like that. And now I have a minus in front of the transfer function, which means that you can, you can implement both positive gain and negative gain in a differential circuit quite easily. I've included an example here that you could work through if you wanted to. And the point here is to show that using these uh, transconductors and capacitors, we can actually generate a general purpose sort of first order transconductance type of filter where the input voltage, so input here is high impedance and the output voltage here, well, that's all, that's, mm -hmm. That's not that high impedance because we have the capacitor, but anyway, we can probably drive something. And as you can see, once we put up the uh, transfer function for the capacitors and the, the GMs, we can map our K1 to CX divided by CA plus CX, where then those are the capacitors and the same for the K0 and the omega zero. Now I still need to sort of work out for my particular filter, what sort of K1 or K0 or omega zero do I want? That you will get from the filter synthesis. But once you have those, once you have your filter frequencies and your gain, then you can just plug that in and you can figure out what sort of transconductance do you need and what sort of capacitance do you need? A similar thing for the uh, biquadratic, you have a slightly more complex structure and the same thing here. Once I have my S domain transfer function and I know what sort of Ks I want and so on, I can work out what the capacitors and the transconductances need to be. And as long as I design that then, I'm good. So capacitors, I assume you know how to make those. Well, we just pick them from the library and put them in, right? The transconductor, however, is a bit more involved. I would recommend that you go to papers and you try to search for a transconductor in the technology that you're working. But quite often when we work with transconductors, we end up with something that looks very similar to an op-amp. What you're looking at now is the standard differential pair with the positive input voltage and the minus input voltage. This is from one of my master students way back. We have the tail current source, we have a couple of devices that are used as cascodes, and then we have the output currents. So a transconductor converts a voltage into a current, and that's what's done here. The challenge with this structure is the linearity. So you won't be able to get a transconductance that is extremely linear, or actually said a different way, the linearity is heavily dependent on the output swing. So it might be linear if you have zero output swing, but if you have an output swing, then the transconductance will be nonlinear. In order, in sort of the differential circuit, we also need a common mode feedback. Something needs to define the DC voltage level at the output here, and, and that can only happen if we have a common mode feedback, since both of these outputs are high impedance. There is a second type of filter stage, and I must admit that I usually drift to active RC. They're linear. They're quite easy to understand, I find. We have the same thing there. Uh, we have a general first order filter, shown on the left here, and we can work out the transfer function and put in the uh, Cs and the... In this case, I've actually used conductances instead of resistances. Quite often, the equations just become simpler to work out with the algebra if we use conductances instead of the resistance. But the conductance is just one over the resistance, so it's not a big trick. The same here. As long as we know the K1s, the K0 and omega 0, then we can work out what we actually need to put into the circuit. And same for the biquad. Here I'm only showing half this circuit. This is very common for textbooks examples. So you'll just see the op amp here and it's connected to ground on the positive input. But almost always for filters in actual integrated circuits, it will be differential circuits. So the op amp here will be differential and then 
the actual sort of common mode that the voltages swing around will be set somewhere in the middle, maybe between VDD and ground. So what's important about the, this introduction to filters is that there exists a first and second order sort of general equation, both for GMC and for an active RC. Once you know the sort of filter you want, you can just plug in the uh, coefficients and work out the conductances and the capacitors. Note, for example, that in this general purpose bi-quad, there is actually a negative conductance. And initially you might think, well, that's gonna be hard, negative conductance. But actually, it's not that tricky. In a, in a differential circuit, we can actually use the fact that just swapping the differential signals will give you a negative gain. So that's what you'll see in the full version that uses swap. One important thing to remember is that when we make op-amps, they are not ideal. What I mean by that is they don't have infinite DC gain. So even though this case, the circuit is an integrator, so the, the current that is from, well, the current that is formed from VI down to ground, because the uh, virtual ground here will be at zero, since we have connected the positive to zero, the current that goes in will sort of be integrated on the capacitor. So current will go in here, and well, it has to flow out there because there is nowhere, <laughs> the current cannot flow into the the um, negative input on the op amp, which means that the output voltage, well, let's see, that needs to go down. So we integrate down, but it doesn't matter. The main point is, had this been an ideal integrator, we would have infinite gain in this loop we can make very high gain in op amps. We can make sort of 60, 70, 80 dB, depending on technology, but we can't make it infinite, which means at some point we sort of stop. We it, it, The um, structure that we're looking here at here is no longer a perfect integrator. It is leaky. And the, the real transfer function of the system that we're looking at here will be something like uh, shown top uh, right here. So we have the uh, DC gain of the op amp, and we have the R and the C, that's from the uh, equation. And then we have the unity gain frequency of the op amp in there. So although OTAs are really good, they are not perfect but quite often they're good enough. It's kind of cool to see what people do with filters. What you're looking at on the left side now is a complex or quadrature continuous time sigma delta modulator. So sigma delta modulation is something that we'll talk about in a number of weeks, but it is a way of converting an analog signal into a digital signal using a, well, noise shaping methodology. In order to make sigma delta modulators, we have to have very high gain filters. And that's what we see in the first section here. So these are active RC filters. We have the uh, input signal on the in-phase signal and we have the quadrature phase signal. The cool thing about complex modulation is that you can actually make a filter that is asymmetric around zero frequency, which is what you're seeing on the right side here. So we can see that the, the bandwidth of the filter is actually only at positive frequencies. This is what's used, in, for example, in radios. This can be used because it can give us an image reduction. So if we convert the 2.4 gigahertz into what's called an intermediate frequency in the radio, we can actually reject the image frequency. So um, if I have, for example, the wanted signal is at 2.401 gigahertz, and I multiply by 2.4 gigahertz, then I shift that 1 megahertz, or 2.401 gigahertz signal down to 1 megahertz. But turns out that 
watts at uh, 2.399 megahertz <laughs> or 2.399 gigahertz that since shifts down to minus one megahertz and in order to distinguish between plus and minus one megahertz i actually need complex numbers complex signal processing which is what you're looking at here because then i can actually suppress the negative frequencies and accept the positive frequencies and we can see here uh, let's see i don't know if you can see my cursor it's maybe it's just a bit small but after the first stage we can see there's an inversion so here we probably have some sort of minus gain in the system and we're feeding in we're feeding from the in phase to the quadrature phase and that's how we implement the shift in frequency um, of the complex system really really cool adcs but don't expect that you'll understand these type of adcs sort of immediately a complex adc or a quadrature <laughs> adc like this if i were given the task by my bosses to make one, I'd probably say I would want one or two designers with me. So one to do the top level, that would be me. One to do the ADCs, so the, the actual sort of uh, ADCs, maybe the DAX, and one to do the filter maybe. And then we put everything together and it'll take us maybe a year and it will be... 80 to 100 schematics so quite complex so don't expect that you sort of just throw things like this together in an hour and then you're done analog design takes a lot of time i wanted today to give you an insight into what i consider my favorite ota operation operational transconductance amplifier so I've made a few both filters and ADCs, um, mostly switch cap ADCs, and I've sort of settled on an op amp that I that's sort of my go to. That's the first thing I try. If that doesn't work, then of course I have to change it or do something else. But the first thing I try is always a current mirror op amp. So what you're looking at now is actually the fully differential current mirror op amp. So here. We can see the differential pair that goes into the current mirror stage and then mirrored around. What's slightly different about this current mirror op amp is that we also take out and mirror the currents to the end side. So for example, if I increase the voltage on my VIP, then the current will increase through the positive side of the differential pair. Increasing current here will lead to an increase at the output here, pulling the output high. In addition, increasing the current here, which will increase the current there, and will pull this output low. And since the current reduces on the negative side, that increases the voltage here, reduces the current here, and that reduces the pull down which pushes the VOP further up. So it's sort of a push-pull, not push-pull, but it's sort of a fully differential current mirror op amp. I like this op amp because it's simple and it's first order, which means that the dominant pole usually is at the output and I can just load it down with some capacitance to get it stable. Additionally, it's quite insensitive to common mode shift because the common mode at the input, if that shifts down and sort of starts to put my tail current source into tryout, well, it doesn't really change this uh, op amp much. The whole, the whole, um, it might become a bit slower, but it still sort of kind of works. Another thing is that the current mirrors here, they can be, if a single current mirror like you're sh shown here is sufficient, maybe I'll get a gain of 50 dB or something like that because the gain is going to be given by the transconductance of the differential pair times the output resistance at VOP here. And the output resistance at VOP and VON is pretty much determined by the output resistance of the current mirrors, which means if I need higher gain, 
I can use cast codes or even go to active cast codes for the current mirrors. But of course, this op amp will need a common mode feedback because the VOP and VON are both high impedance outputs, which means that the DC voltage level is not controlled and we need to control it. In order to control the output common mode, we first need to sense <laughs> what the output common mode is. Now, it, this is a tricky bit. Here it depends very much on what type of transistors you have available and what type of outs output swing you have to tolerate and how high resistance you can use. The reference for the common mode, in this case, you can just divide down the uh, VDD maybe, if you're not that sensitive to, to supply noise. And this would, for example, be VDD divided by half. The other part here of the circuit is actually in order to not destroy the uh, gain of the op amp too much. Because if I use a bunch of, so if I use a source follower, to sort of step down the voltage, then I don't load down resistively my uh, VON and VOP. I have to do that the same for the reference also. And in order to generate the common mode, I just divide between the VOP and VON, and then I have sensed my common mode. If you're not that sensitive to gain, if you don't need really, really, really high gain, you can actually drop the um, source followers and connect the resistors directly to the output of your op amp. But of course then the output resistance of your op amp will be determined by the resistors here, which means that if you have a really, really high gain op amp, that might be a problem. The source followers, that's the tricky part in the different technologies because the threshold voltage might be large. So there might be quite a big drop from VON down to the source point but for example, in some technologies, you'll have um, you will have native transistors or with almost zero threshold voltage, or you have low voltage transistors, or so on. Once you have generate the uh, common mode output and a uh, reference, well, then we can use an op amp. We can put that into an op amp. This is a simple current mirror op amp. It just has a dual output stage in order to control the DC level on VON and VOP. And this is the fully differential op amp I usually go to if I have to make something. And in order for you to actually be able to try it out <laughs> and replicate it, I've made one. <laughs> so uh, this uh, picture is going to be really, really hard to read on the video. But at the Connor OTA Sky 130 on my GitHub, you will find the op amp inside the design and the op amp schematic. I may, it looks like I've forgotten to push the uh, symbol. Oh, that's not much there. Did I forget to push? forgotten to commit. Okay. Oh, good thing I checked that. So now you'll see the schematic. Well, <laughs> a bit hard to read since it's just text and the symbol. But if you download that, you will see the op-amp schematic. The first part is a current bias, just regular Casco bias. We get a current in here. Um, normally about one micran, one to two microamps in this technology. We mirror that current to generate a bias voltage for PMOS to do, <laughs> and then mirror that in order to get a cascade voltage both for the PMOS and for the NMOS. I'm using here a library of pre-made transistors. And it might be a bit hard to see here. Let me zoom in. These transistors have a certain naming strategy. So that's a library. It's a PMOS. And what this means is that I have eight contacts and uh, it's twice the gate length. That's just, I find it easier to use transistors if I quantize them. 
So it's possible I just made a library that contains all the tra these transistors. And using that library, I can relatively easily figure out what sort of currents and um, also what sort of bias currents I want to put in. So if they could do ATR, that's where the uh, transistors are. And let's find the transistor that we're looking at here. So that's an 8C2F. So design, actually not design, simulation. Oh, wrong repo. <laughs> Sorry. ATR. There we go. Simulation, maybe a bit bigger. And here I have all my transistors. So we wanted the PCH8 contact 2F. There we go. And readme. So I've simulated all these transistors. And here you can see that in order to get a GM over ID of 10, you'd have to put about 18 microamps into this transistor. And for GM over ID of 15, well, then it's order about f it's no, on the order of four. And uh, this also has the VGS, which makes it a bit easier to figure out sort of what sort of headroom uh, will I be working with here. You have the VTH, you also have the VDSATs and the RDS. So for example, this is a mega ohm. An intrinsic gain for that matter also. We. <coughs> so that's how I usually design. I quantize my transistors, unless there's some very special transistors, and then I just build it like building in blocks. Because when we get to my op-amp, for example, most of the transistors are current mirror transistors. So for the PMOS, for the current mirror transistors, I'm using 8C2F. For the NMOS, maybe let's zoom in a bit more so you can see. For the um, PMOS, as I said, 8C2F. Now, the mobility of holes is lower than electrons, so for the NMOS, I am using a bit longer transistors in order to get roughly the same um, overdrive or be effective. For the CAS codes, well, for the CAS codes, I just want a high, transcondu high transconductance, so I'm lowering the gate length to 1.2 times the minimum gate length. And I'm trying to use the same number of contacts. What I mean by contacts, maybe I should uh, demonstrate that. You know, I try work, magic. And just have to resize the window because magic opens up very big. Library manager. Transistors, and we want the, let's do the that one, load. Okay, and here you can see what I mean by eight contacts. So, the bulks for the transistor are the green, the green stuff at the end here. Let's see if we can uh, maybe remove some of the implant layers. I never remember where the implant layers are. Maybe they're up here. Yeah, that's a bit better. Okay. The box are the green stuff at the end. The gate is the uh, two red uh, rectangles in the middle. <laughs> and I lo always like to use two fingers on my transistors. The reason for that is I kind of want the same, well, current direction in silicon matters. So it matters if you go up or if you go down, if the current goes up or down. And if I use always two fingers, then I always have current in both directions, which means I don't need to worry about which way I flip my transistor. The source is the contact at the, outs uh, on the, out <laughs> the outset here. And while well, it's not easy to see for you, but the 8C, that's how many contacts there will be here. Now it looks like four, but we can see the difference between an 8C and a uh, 1.2C. No, that's the F. 
let's do a what do I do here? Eight C yeah and two C. That will be not as wide. But if I always use use eight C, let's do the smaller gate length. Then it also becomes easy to do the layout because then I can sort of stack them on top of each other and they can actually overlap. In order to demonstrate that, we could load a cell and we can place one of those transistors and did that work? There we go. That's one. And let's expand that. Oh, crap. So I wanted to see what's inside. There we go. And if I set my cursor here, I can add another 8C, for example, the wide one place. Okay. And what you will see now is let's select that and actually let's go file, edit. Oh, where's the grid again? Window, grid on, set grid at one micron. That's maybe too large. Set grid as then. Do. <laughs> you can see how uh, well versed I'm in. Oh, crap. Okay. Just a second. Okay, I finally got it. <laughs> Takes a bit of time to remember the key combinations and magic. W my point was that when I make transistors that are the same width and I lay them out horizontally, then I can actually mix and match. So the top here can be the source transistor or the current mirror transistor and the bottom could be the CAS code. So that's why I use 8C for most of the transistors. For the NMOS input, of course, it's uh, higher GM I want. So I use the 1.2 times the minimum length. And that's the differential op amp. For the sensing of the common mode, it's similar as from before. Uh, but maybe there's slight differences. In order to get roughly the same loading on the two source followers, I also have resistor to ground and capacitors. That just gives me a bit better stability because it's sort of a feed forward zero across these resistors to the COM mode send signal into the op amp and where I compare it to the uh, COM mode reference and then feed it in. This may look a bit strange, this sort of duplicated output stage, but the trick here is that these current mirrors in the op amp feed into the cascodes of the main differential op amp. So VCO and P, if we go up here, you can see that's VCONP sort of feeds into the CAS code. And by doing that, I don't drop my hmm, output impedance. So the output impedance is still given by the CAS code or seen into this top stage. Right. So that was a little bit about op amps. Sorry to interrupt the broadcast, <laughs> but I forgot one thing I wanted to show you. So inside the... Um, Op amp. Let me make this slightly bigger so you can hopefully see it even on a small screen. Okay. So let's open the schematic. I still haven't figured out why the schematic f looks funky in OBS. If you ever figure that out, well, let me know. But what I wanted to show was the simulations. So inside the sim directory, 
there will be one folder called CNR OLTA and inside there will be a number of SPICE files and here we have a test bench for a transient simulation the loop stability of the uh, differential loop and the loop stability of a common feedback loop and those you can run with if we do make typical tv tran that's well, tran it will run the simulation in ng, ng spice of course you need to ic a csim installed and so on and i like to use uh, C <laughs> cic sim wave output tran tran raw so I made uh, this Python based uh, waveform viewer. I couldn't find any uh, other one. And in here, let's see, this is the transient. So we kind of want to watch the input signal. And then let's have a look at the output signal. Now inside the transient simulation, what I've actually done is to have a feedback network for the uh, op amp. Of there's 100k at the input and then there's 500k in the feedback which means that we have a gain of 5 and we can see that closed loop that pretty much is uh, fitting we have a swing here of plus minus 20 millivolts while it may be a bit small to see I don't know if I can actually make it bigger hopefully you can see that but in any case the bottom graph is the output and here it is a output swing of 100 millivolts, all, almost 100 millivolts, not exactly. We should, can also run the loop stability, oh sorry, uh, typical TB LSTB, and that will also find, so loop stability analysis is, well there's many papers on that, what's used in this simulation I'm showing now is something called the TN loop stability where or Middlebrook where TN is an improvement where it does uh, two AC simulations injecting current in a loop and injecting voltage in a loop and then from that it's possible to cal calculate the loop transfer function and get the loop gain and the phase margin so as you can see the phase margin in this system now is pretty good or good enough <laughs> The unit gain frequency, you can see that. We can see the gain, gain margin, and the low frequency gain. So this has a 76 dB. And we can also have a look at the loop stability. So we can just see the standard body plot. I think I want the face first. No, I don't want the face first. I want the magnitude first. <laughs> And then in the bottom plot, I want the face. That makes me happy. So here you can see we have high gain at low frequency. So the frequency is on the x-axis. And then we can see the face response. So when we're crossing zero here, we still have about 70, 71. Yeah, so the face margin is, uh, what was it? 56, which is okay. Right, that's what I wanted to show. What my favorite op amp is. Now, you may have your own favorite. I mean, there are many good ones. It could be a folder cast code. It could be a Miller, but then take care about noise or power noise. It could be a folding recycling op amp. <laughs> you need to find your own. And Filter design is really about making the op amp. That's the hard part. The, um, of course, finding the transfer function and all that stuff, that's a bit of manual work, but uh, that's more sort of, once you have the co coefficients for the transfer function, it's more straightforward. Have a fantastic day. And I guess I should start to say sort of the like and subscribe and comment. Uh, let me know if there are things that you want to have lectures on. See you later.